afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa Ezell. I'm the Federal Society's Vice President for our Lawyers Division. And uh, to kick off our lunch, I am going to introduce the, the first of the two phenomenal jurists we have in our lunch uh, discussion. Um, Judge Alice Batchelor is somebody who needs no introduction in this state. She has um, been a longtime federal judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. She was first appointed in 1991 and assumed senior status in 2019. Um, nominated by President George H.W. Bush. She served as Chief Judge of the Court from 2009 to 2014. We are delighted she is joining us today and she will be introducing our keynote luncheon speaker, Judge Batchelder. Well, I'm really delighted to be at a Federalist Society meeting in spite of the attempts of the Judicial Conference of the United States to keep judges from doing this for the last couple of years. But I'm really honored to be introducing our featured speaker today. She's a remarkable person. As a judge, she's been among the best of the best. And she is uh, someone that I would say I've really wished I could have lunch with on a regular basis. Um, uh, unfortunately, she persists in hanging out in two of the three places that I avoid at all costs, DC and California. <laughs> um, I first met her during a cocktail hour at a um, James Wilson Institute affair. And I confess that was in DC, but I got out of it as fast as I could. Um, and somehow she and I ended up sitting in a booth during the cocktail hour and talking while we waited for the dinner to begin. And I think I can say for sure that that is the only cocktail hour I've ever experienced that I was sorry to see end. I don't need to drone through Judge Brown's bio. You already know it or you can read it on your own. What I want to do is give you a taste of why Judge Brown is so highly regarded, especially by people like us, as a jurist. And to do that, I'm just going to point to a few things that she has said in some separate writings during her sterling career on the DC circuit. I'll start with New Jersey versus the EPA, which was a 2011 case in which the issue before the court was EPA rules regulating mercury emissions from power plants. And a group of Native American Indians uh, tribes had intervened in the uh, case. And the issue was whether the intervener uh, whose participation and arguments had had no effect whatever on the outcome of the case, was entitled to recover its costs and fees from the EPA. The majority said yes. Judge Brown dissented, carefully wading through the facts in the case and refuting the majority and concluding thus. Since preserving the public fisc from unreasonable depredations also serves the public interest, I would not be so eager to find new ways to waste other people's money. I dissent, and I should say that other people's money was capitalized. In Emily's List versus the Federal Election Commission, Judge Brown concurred in the majority's decision that both on both statutory and constitutional grounds, the regulations at issue had to be vacated. Her concurrence, her separate writing, is both principled and prescient, and I would add, probably courageous. It was principled in her insistence that even though she agreed with the outcome that the court had reached, the court had no business reaching the constitutional question it decided, because the case could and should have been decided solely on the basis of the statute. But she nonetheless tackled the majority's constitutional analysis, and I, I just love what she said. She said, indeed, I agree with what seems to be the unstated premise. If the Supreme Court's cases made any sense, the First Amendment would protect much more than pornography, profanity, and pyrotechnics. If constitutional law were better acquainted with the Constitution, regulations such as these would never survive Article III scrutiny. Her concurrence was prescient in that case because she dissected and indeed eviscerated McConnell v. the FEC, the case on which the majority had based its unnecessary First Amendment analysis. And as to that, she said, McConnell's careless invocation of access and influence, 
two integral aspects of political participation, as synonyms for corruption is likely to doom any argument for protection of core political speech. Someday the Supreme Court may be persuaded to reconsider this approach, but that cannot be our task. Well, miracle of miracles, not long after the Supreme Court did just that and decided Citizens United. There are so many of Judge Brown's separate writings to choose from, but I'm going to point to just one more. And this is a sort of an esoteric one. This is the case of Keep Siegel versus Purdue, in which the majority affirmed the district court's approval of a settlement agreement settling a class action brought by Native American farmers and ranchers against the United States Department of Agriculture. And the settlement agreement included uh, a Cypre provision and then eventually a modification of that Cypre provision, whereby an enormous sum which was remaining in the settlement fund after the class members' claims had all been settled and paid, that money was not returned to the government, but according to this, the settlement agreement and the Cypre provision, it was to be re uh, distributed to, not to the class members, but to non-party, non-profits that provided services to the class members. Judge Brown dissented, pointing out that Congress had not appropriated the money in the settlement fund for anything other than payment of the actual claims of the class members, and the judicial power does not include changing that appropriation. I point to this because I think every one of us here should love Judge Brown's sum up of why the court had no constitutional authority either to require distribution of the funds to class members, all of whose claims had already been settled and paid, or to approve the Cypre provision modified or not, and indeed the court had no power to do anything except require the return of the money to its source. And here's what Judge Brown said. John Adams' observation, quote, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people, unquote, and, quote, is wholly inadequate to the government of any other, is often quoted. Few, however, explain what he meant. In the same passage, Adams admonished an America that, quote, assumed the language of justice and moderation while it is practicing iniquity and extravagance. In such a nation, he warned, avarice, ambition, and revenge or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Juris, <clears throat> Juris Thomas Cooley arrived at the same sentiment when he wrote that a Constitution cannot be completely understood by its words, but must also make reference to that body of rules and maxims in accordance with which the powers of sovereignty are habitually exercised. There are, in short, norms, Judge Brown said, which, <clears throat> upon which self-government depends. The Constitution presumes them, but the character of our people determines whether we keep them. Going on to quote Alexander Hamilton from Federalist No. 1, Judge Brown continued, it seems to have been reserved to the people of this country by their conduct and example to decide the important question whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. And Judge Brown concluded, the conduct of those in this case proves how little the Constitution will matter when good character ceases to be informed by adherence to one's oath of office and is primarily defined by how generous you are willing to be with someone else's money. I can't resist adding in light of who the parties to these three cases were, that it's true that each of these cases preceded the ascendancy of the woke mob, but nonetheless, like everything else Judge Brown has done, these writings demonstrate her total indifference to anything except what the law and the Constitution require. So I would say, I would ask, to how many of us do the opening words of the 26th Psalm really apply? Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart, for thy loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. 
These words apply to Janice Rogers Brown. Ladies and gentlemen, Judge Brown. Well, good afternoon. Thank you. I want to thank Lisa Izell and Robert Alt for the invitation to join you today. After more than a year of virtual house arrest and interactions via Zoom, I can say with great sincerity, it's good to see you. And it's wonderful to be here in person. And I want to thank Alice for that introduction. That may have been the best introduction I have ever had. <laughs> So thank you. Um, I have to confess at the outset that I think this is going to be uh, a somewhat odd speech. Um, part of the reason for that is that I rarely repeat speeches, although I often return to themes. Um, but on this occasion, I was asked to reprise a speech um, that I did for the Federalist Lawyers Convention back in November. And though the speech aired after the election, it was written and delivered to a camera uh, before the election. And at that time, it wasn't really clear whether the summer of our discontent was an aberration or the emergence of a new paradigm. Now it seems clear it was the latter. Antifa and BLM are the shock troops of the woke elite the heirs of the radicals of 1968, who have won the culture war. They reject the wisdom of Sesame Street, i.e., one of these things is not like the other, in favor of the madness of Mao. We find ourselves not just facing marauding mobs who claim American society is irredeemably unjust and the American system must be utterly destroyed, burned to the ground, and rebuilt according to their revolutionary blueprint, but also dealing with a political realignment in which the presidential administration, the federal government, the media, uh, the whole of the array of woke capitalists and the academy seem to be committed to making this dystopian vision our reality. As a country, we have faced existential threats before. But this time, I wonder if America still has the cultural stamina to resist. The tools or weapons we have used in the past seem no longer sufficient. America has always been characterized by the ideal that, as Josh Mitchell describes it, citizens can be self-governing, living and working together under the rule of law. And in response to the Cold War, it was enough to summon our rhetorical gifts. We could win the debate. Logic and facts were on our side. Alas, neither rhetoric nor reason will be quite enough this time. America is in the grip of a new awakening, or more precisely, awokening. And this is not just a political problem. It is a spiritual problem. Last year, Zach Goldberg did a deep dive into the woke revolution that he saw transforming American politics. What he found, he said, is that the baseline attitudes expressed by white liberals on racial and social justice questions have become radically more liberal. And this revolution in moral sentiment has led to an ideological stridency and intolerance of anyone or anything that stands in their way. This ongoing transformation, what Matthew Inglesis has described as the great awakening, has moved white liberals so far to the left on questions of race and racism that they are now to the left of even the typical black voter. Now the woke elite act like white saviors who must lead the rest of the country, including the racial minorities whose interests they claim to represent, to a vision of justice the less enlightened groups would not choose for themselves. Because of their outsized political influence, Goldberg observes, 
The danger is that woke white activists acting on behalf of voiceless minorities have had their perceptions distorted by social media tinted caricatures that obscure more objective measures of reality and end up silencing or ignoring what the voiceless groups themselves have to say about what policies are in their best interests. While Goldberg uh, finds liberals greater concern for the outgroups and even the world as a whole praiseworthy, he admits a problem arises when these moral emotions become hyperactive and detached from reality when they motivate the division of society into allies and enemies, and when they generate a level of sanctimonious outrage and judgment that places all political dissent beyond the pale. In his view, the advent of digital and social media has fomented just such a carnival of excesses. Goldberg's explanation is entirely plausible, but the orgy of destruction in our streets, which woke supremacists have praised and financially supported, leads me to a less benign conclusion. The totalitarian overreach of the woke supremacy is not a mistake born of excessive zeal. It is a feature. So today, I want to spend a few minutes sharing some personal reflections on rabbits, porcupines, music, and the American way. Please try to pay attention, because there will be a test. I know this may sound like a strange and disjointed collection of topics, but as I grow older, I see fiercer connections between seemingly unrelated ideas and events. This may be the beginning of wisdom. On the other hand, it may simply signal the onslaught of Alzheimer's. Only time will tell. <laughs> so first, uh, the parable. Once upon a time, there was a rabbit who lived in a forest. He was fat and happy, very laid back character. He had built himself a nice snug burrow underground. His best friend was a porcupine um, who lived in the woods. One day, a terrible fire broke out and the porcupine's home was completely destroyed. The rabbit was concerned for the porcupine and immediately invited him to share his burrow. The porcupine happily accepted. It was a tight fit, but little by little, the porcupine pushed and twisted and snuggled himself deeper and deeper into the rabbit's burrow. The, frantic, the rabbit, frantically trying to avoid the porcupine's painful quills, curled himself into a tighter and tighter space. Then he tried to stretch himself out, smaller and smaller, thinner and thinner, but finally, it was no use. He had to leave the burrow. The porcupine had the place all to himself. This parable is important because it illustrates what happens when an open society encounters a closed society. The open society loses. So, then the biography. Perhaps 20 years ago, I heard a program on NPR called Jazz Profiles, which uh, devoted an entire segment to Mary Lou Williams. Uh, if you are not jazz aficionados, you probably never heard of her. Um, I was only vaguely familiar with her name. She started um, performing in 1916 at the age of six, gigging with early swing groups as a teenager. And she's credited by, credited by many as being a bridge from boogie woogie to be bebop. Um, some critics called her the history of jazz. But when she was still in kindergarten, Jack Howard, one of the best known stride piano players of the swing era, taught her the importance of a strong and loud left hand. This was the main characteristic of stride piano. In those days when many bands did not have a drop, drummer and the bass was unamplified, it was the piano that provided both the tempo and the bass line. Thus it was said that the piano was holding everything up. Jazz musicians refer to this as bottom. It is their way of describing the foundation, the structure, or framework on which everything else rests. Without that driving, relentless beat, without the fullness supplied by those crashing left-handed chords, the rest of the band lacks tempo and contrast. The front man had the fame, the solo of us got the glory, but the powerful left hand of the stride pianist was what made the music happen. 
As I was listening to some of the early compositions of Mary Lou Williams, I could feel the strength of her hand. Relentless as a locomotive, steady as a heartbeat, providing that steadiness required discipline, self-restraint, self-control, and humility. And listening to those powerful, beautiful, mysterious chords on a Sunday afternoon, I had this sudden insight that the structure of music is the structure of everything. It is not, as the modern world seems to think, chaos that is creative. Bringing order out of chaos is the creative act. So I can see from the frown on your brows uh, that you are perplexed. You're wondering how all this can have anything at all to do with your concerns in the real world. Well, I think it might. The profile of Williams included snippets of interviews, commentaries from other musicians about her accomplishments, but mostly what she said. She said she's changed her style with each period. She was always experimenting. She changed her emphasis, but she never abandoned her roots. The left hand, she said, gave you strength and a great beat in your head. You didn't have to stride after the mid-30s. You could play rhythmic things on top because the beat was embedded in your head. It is this insight that the foundation remains essential even when only the musician knows it's there that provides the kernel for today's discussion. In reality, innovation only works when we understand and remember the foundation, the first principles. That is as true for a culture, a country, or a civilization as it is for a musical composition. Of course, now, the whole Marvel universe is both woke and broke. But there was a time not so long ago when if I ask, what did Superman fight for? Those of my generation would answer without hesitation, truth, justice, and the American way. When I was a child, this was an easy response. We didn't know exactly what truth, justice, and the American way meant, but we did know it was good because Superman was one of the good guys. By the time I was a young woman, though, we sang a different song. We claimed, there ain't no good guys, there ain't no bad guys. There's only you and me, and we just disagree. Well, that uh, song was not intended as an ode to moral relativism. It was particular and specific about the end of a love affair, but the attitude and sensibility could have served as an anthem for my generation. There's only one problem with this little ditty. It is wrong. Wholly, flatly, irredeemably wrong. There are good guys. There are bad guys. And only the truth can armor us for perpetual struggle against good and evil. And contra Gil Scott Heron, the revolution, rehearsing an eerily similar set of grievances is not only being televised, it is being featured on YouTube, captured on thousands of cell phones, and broadcast on Facebook Live. Something has gone terribly wrong. In Hong Kong, people resisting a brutal regime sing our national anthem. In America, men who have become millionaires playing a game take a knee to show their disrespect for it. While the people of Hong Kong are waving our national flag, our domestic terrorists, the democratic socialists, are burning it. Millions of people continue to migrate to America seeking the freedom its principles enshrine. Rampaging mobs rule the streets of America, looting, burning, and pillaging, demanding that those principles be disavowed. Evan Sayet explains why the culture war is dev devolving into a civil war. One side shouts, make America great again, by rolling back socialist advances that have destroyed schools, hollowed out industry, and undermined freedoms, while the other argues that America is a disease and that only socialism is the cure. American universities certainly owe me a culpus for this reversal of fortune. There might not be a mob to placate if American universities had taken their role as the gatekeeper of serious academic work and objective pedagogy seriously. Bruce Bauer notes it was once the job of the university to extol the rare virtues of the West. Now the university sees its job as teaching hatred of its failures. Thus, 
The American Academy served as the incubator for the virulent brand of cultural Marxism that is now overtaking us. Instead of defending liberal universalism, the academy, administrators, and most faculty caved to the threats of student protesters. What began as an attack on alleged institutional racism quickly morphed into an assault on the integrity of the academic enterprise and, in the fullness of time, the American creed. Of course, the treason of the intellectuals did not begin in 1968. As Julian Binda observed soon after the end of World War II, intellectuals abandoned their high calling once they had opposed the political passions of the multitude. According to Binda, thanks to the intellectuals, humanity did evil for 2,000 years, but honored good. This contradiction was an honor to the human species and formed the rift whereby civilization slipped into the world. Needless to say, once intellectuals decided to be in the business of organizing political hatreds, the recrudescence of barbarism was inevitable. However, the mythology of Western oppression of perpetual systemic racism on which the mobocracy relies to justify the socialist assault on America can be traced directly from the abandonment of academic standards in the late 60s through the rise of critical theorists in the 1990s. What Pluckrose and Lindsay described as the postmodern turn in critical theory, a rejection of enlightenment values, particularly objective knowledge, universal truth, science, or evidence more broadly, as a method for obtaining objective knowledge, the power of reason, the ability to communicate straightforwardly via language, a universal human nature, and individualism, paved the way for a poisonous subjectivism. What came to be known as social justice scholarship is not scholarship at all. It is activism by another name. Teaching is no longer about helping students to think for themselves. Teaching is deemed a political act, and the only acceptable politics is identity politics as defined by social justice theory. Now, tenured radicals can openly declare themselves to be activists and teach activism in courses that require students to accept the ideological basis of social justice as true. CRT, critical race theory, and DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, may seem brand new. That is only because Americans are no longer taught history. The crisis of the West is fundamentally a crisis of reason, namely the loss of confidence in reason's ability to discover truth and guide human action. In a prophetic speech at the Young Men's Lyceum in Springfield, Illinois, Abraham Lincoln said that what no invading foeman could do, the silent artillery of time might accomplish. As a nation of free men, he said, we must live through all time or die by suicide. In a similar vein, Lincoln cautioned against too great a zeal in doing good. An imprudent devotion to a perfect society fails to accommodate the opinions, beliefs, and prejudices of the community. The rule of the self-righteous is an acute problem for self-government. Though Lincoln agreed with the abolitionist cause, during his second term in the Illinois Assembly, he co-sponsored a resolution that strongly condemned slavery but noted that the promulgation of abolitionist doctrines tended rather to increase than to abate its evils. He recognized the essential principle necessary to self-government. C.S. Lewis expresses this very bluntly. He says, quote, a dogmatic belief in objective value is necessary to the very idea of a rule that is not tyranny or an obedience which is not slavery. As Thomas West points out, the blasé dismissal of enduring values leads to the brine embrace of whatever, whatever ideology feels most comfortable. Alluding to the mobocratic spirit that seized the country decades before the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln warned that um, this was a problem for self-government, and Orestes Brownson, who's writing on the eve of Reconstruction, uh, goes a little further. He seeks to distinguish what he dubbed humanitarian democracy 
from the democracy necessary to preserve a Republican Constitution. He acknowledged the righteousness of the abolitionist cause in opposing slavery, but criticized any opposition on humanitarian or socialist grounds. This is 1860s. He says, the problem, the humanitarian impulse sees the cause as superior to individuals, states, and governments, and holds that all may be trampled in pursuit of a sacred agenda. Thus, humanitarians establish in the name of justice a complete social despotism, which would break up in anarchy in which might makes right. Sound familiar? <laughs> Bronson concluded, proper government depends on the virtue and intelligence of the people, and thus requires fixed standards of immutable justice that could not be constantly changing uh, are the product of some unfolding and historical process. The proponents of identity politics have conveniently abandon the progressive notion that a more just world will naturally evolve. Instead, social justice arbiters now claim for themselves the exclusive right to mete out justice. The beneficiaries of their magnanimity are uniformly good and honorable. The oppressors defined primarily as straight white males, but including women and minorities who eschew the victim mentality and have the audacity to think for themselves are evil and must be punished. And then understand, this is interesting, because the awakening um, is an awakening uh, without God, without forgiveness, without redemption, um, which is why it's so bitter and ugly. This is what happens when man thinks he is God. The civil rights movement sought justice for all, but social justice is not to be conflated with the justice claims of authentic civil rights. Indeed, applied postmodernism, activism, political correctness, and more recently the cancel culture arrived on the scene just as legal equality had largely been achieved and anti-racist, feminist, and LGBT activism began to produce diminishing returns. Indeed, to me, one of the most painful and pernicious aspects of this revival of cultural Marxism is the shameless appropriation of the moral authority of black suffering in the service of an ideology that will only do more harm to black people. Thus, ideological indoctrination has forcefully supplanted the search for truth a result that has led to the closing and coddling of the American mind generally and the minds of people of color specifically. And I, I have used this example before, but it is so startling um, that I use it again. When the black entrepreneur and commentator, Camille Foster, offered an impassioned defense of free speech at Rutgers, he was repeatedly interrupted by the audience chanting, Black Lives Matter. When Foster finally asked, do facts matter? His interlocutor responded, don't tell me about facts. I don't need no facts. In a similar vein, when students at Claremont objected to Heather MacDonald speaking at the school, they wrote a letter asserting, quote, white supremacy venerates the idea of objectivity as a means of silencing oppressed people. The letter continues, the idea that there is a single truth, the truth, is a construct of the Euro West. The idea that truth is an entity for which we must search is an attempt to silence oppressed people. The worrying thing, Douglas Murray says, is not that students uh, regurgitate such things, it is that they have been taught them in the first place. But um, as in 1984, Winston would understand this. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. This is the intellectual framework which purportedly supports the woke revolution. It most, its most salient characteristic is mendacity. Now instead of universities being the seed beds of virtue, they should be, they have become the dunghills of desolate ideology. 
Those who crow up on that dunghill most loudly will be rewarded with prizes and praise and even institutions, to, in, invitations to share their wisdom. At the end of a recent presentation, Ibram X. Kendi, the new prophet of anti-racism, and I just want to warn you, anti-racism uh, is not anti at all. <laughs> so look carefully because the language is being abused and misused. But anyway, the new prophet of anti-racism was asked what he thinks would be the Rosa Parks moment of our time, and he answered, um, socialism. He may not have meant to be quite that candid, but the response explains a lot. According to Kendi, we must fight discrimination with discrimination, and anyone who disagrees is a racist. Well, I disagree. And I note the new anti-racists are virtually indistinguishable from the bigots of old, except that they are bolder and they have invented a more vicious, capacious, and unpredictable racism. America stands accused of systemic racism because anti-racists assume American politics, economics, and policing has been corrupted by racial prejudice. That prejudice explains the entire difference in social economic status between blacks and others. Anyone not actively engaged in dismantling the status quo is a racist or at least a collaborator and therefore a legitimate target for attack. Mr. Kendi's careless heuristic is false and incoherent. Just think about what this means, that the reason that people listen to BLM um, and to the anti-racists um, is because uh, time after time, they have appropriated the moral authority of the black struggle in order to say to people, we've been here before, you know what you need to do, and yet what they're doing is absolutely the opposite <laughs> of what the civil rights movement start, you know, stood for. So in some ways, it's more pernicious than the old racism, which at least um, was honest about um, their agenda. Rosa Parks did not take that seat on a segregated M Montgomery bus to usher in a new era of socialism. She would have been appalled at the thought. She meant to strike a blow against actual institutional racism. She was challenging an unjust law that denied her equal rights. Rosa Parks was seeking to be treated equally by the law. Mr. Kendi contends the goal of assimilation is racist. Racism is now less a description of actual conduct and more of a powerful disciplinary tool that can be used to bend others to the contours of the woke will. Kendi's aim is to broaden the privileges of those entitled to fling the word racist around and to extend its power to even more marginal misdeeds. His new and improved racism rests just as firmly on unexamined and unproven assumptions as the old racism he abjures. The, in the racism of old, the political class sacrificed the dignity and aspirations of black people to guarantee their hold on power. Now the woke elite jettisoned the doctrine of non-discrimination uh, Ibram Kendi and his ill condemn all white people for the sin of slavery and the racism that was integral to it. Anti-racists also reject the very idea of government neutrality. To treat people with equality, neutrality, and respect, he says, is not just insufficient, it is illegitimate, a racist obstruction. And yet, Mr. Kendi did not turn down the prizes and perks offered by woke supremacists who happen to be white. And although he sneers at capitalism and argues it must be extinguished, he charges a hefty fee to institutions and school districts for dispensing his wisdom. Those who hate freedom always use the same basic ploy. Utopians, Revel reminds us, are shrewd seducers. They propose the opposite of what they are really aiming for. The tragedy is revolutionaries reproduce the very evils they said they would extirpate. Thus, those who proclaim themselves anti-fascist have presided over a reign of terror, burning, looting, desecrating, accosting people in restaurants, on sidewalks, and even threatening their homes. And the anti-racists have whipped up a new and improved racism, more virulent, more stifling, and restrictive than simple racial animus could ever be. 
I won't go into all of the um, ways in which uh, Kendi's view of how the world should be is appalling, including that he thinks there should be a federal bureau of anti-discrimination, uh, you know, which will regulate everything. Um, if you can bear it, uh, read his book called Stamp from, from the Beginning. Um, you probably need a bottle of wine. <laughs> um, the BLM Manifesto reads like a guidebook for continuing immiseration of poor black folks. In addition to destroying the traditional family, a task they arrive at about 60 years too late, BLM proposes to dismantle the juvenile justice system to let all criminals out of prison and to defund the police. Um, it is highly unlikely that the residents in urban neighborhoods favor this initiative. They know that in the absence of aggressive police intervention, the negative pathologies of the ghetto will increase exponentially. Um, the suffering that would result from this ill-advised initiative will outweigh the harm inflicted by police confrontations, even those that end violently. And significantly, BLM has no interest in reducing violence that cannot be used to indict a system. The organization is indifferent to the horrific toll exacted by black-on-black -black crime, to the young lives from toddlers to teeny boppers, snuffed out by random gunfights and drive-bys, to the grief of mothers whose sons are victims of the cultural of street violence. Those black lives don't matter. And that blindness is justified because the woke, in the words of Ta-Nehisi Coates, are entitled to subject America to an exceptional moral standard. Of course, they themselves are exempt from that exceptional moral standard. The woke supremacist indictment of America as the great Satan contains a large measure of falsehood, hyperbole, and distortion in addition to egregious statistical errors. Falsifying history to serve a political agenda has a name. It's called propaganda. The power of the cultural assault depends on the thesis that free market capitalism and slavery are inextricably linked. Thus, only by abandoning the free market and embracing political redistribution will America atone for its tainted inheritance. In other words, the answer is uh, socialism. <laughs> Unfortunately for the woke thesis, George Fitzhugh, the leading pro-slavery theorist prior to the Civil War, argued in 1854 that the tenets of free market capitalism were at war with all kinds of slavery, for they in fact assert that individuals and peoples prosper most when they are governed least. The woke approach seems doubly ironic. Their scholars are arguing atonement for slavery requires repudiating the free market doctrines that Fitzhugh identified as the greatest da danger to slavery itself, and two, showing that socialism is the opposite answer, is the obvious answer to the wickedness of capitalism. To quote Fitzhugh again, slavery is a form, the very best form of socialism. There is not much difference between the slavery of the plantation and the slavery of the gulag, except the latter denies the right even of the mind to be free. Tocqueville recognized this reality when he spoke out against the revolutionary fervor of 1848, the first broadly socialist revolution in Europe. The philosophical essence of the whole intellectual movement of the last century has been the concept of control, of power, as surely in collectivist liberalism as in Marxism. For the project to succeed, human beings must cease to be independent centers of free will and become either cells in the social organiz organism or an inchoate collection of atoms. Then the political power of the state can be used to direct them. As far as I can tell, there's not a nickel's worth of difference between white supremacists, Islamist imperialists, and woke supremacists, and we should call them out. Bigotry is not purified by changing the target. 
Just as we refuse to negotiate with international terrorists, we should refuse to make excuses for domestic terrorists. We cannot compromise with any system whose objective is our destruction. This is not just a difference of opinion. The question is whether the regime of freedom that was founded here can survive the relentless enmity of the slave mentality. The spirit of American liberty, a creed dedicated to limited government, free men, and free markets, represents the only anti-utopian tradition to survive in modern times. I love America. It is a good country that often rises to greatness, miraculous in its recognition of the essence of legitimate government. The courage and generosity of her people make her an exceptional nation. But I do not love America because it is perfect, just the opposite. I cherish this nation's perfect imperfections. Whenever a group or a political class promises perfection in governance, beware. Oppression is battering at the door. I find it increasingly difficult to speak of and for America. Anguish for the loss of freedom's refuge, its principles, its uniqueness, and its manifold virtues clogs my throat. I am reminded of a line from an obscure poet. He said, I had to put my eyes on a diet. My tears were gaining too much weight. Things look bleak. The Dark wind blowing from the future carries a hint of frost, a finality. But no matter, the inevitability of entropy is no reason to despair. Knowing the battle never ends only means that we must redefine winning. I commend to you Tolkien's notion of the old courage. It is a theory of courage that removes all easy hope. Knowing that good is obtained at vast expense while evil recuperates almost at will it's not enough to make a hero change sides. In a 1967 speech entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Dr. Martin Luther King said, let us be dissatisfied until that day when no one will shout white power, when nobody will shout black power, but everyone will talk about God's power and human power. If that day ever comes, that is a plea to which I will gladly add my amen. I am an old black woman. That means I have experienced and forgotten more actual injustice, discrimination, and oppression than this herd of motley mandarins who seek to transform America will ever encounter in their pampered little lives. While they babble endlessly about perfection and purity, what they promote is a vile, toxic remix of the prejudice, bigotry, superstition, and hatred we have struggled to overcome. We are not helpless. We can speak the truth and defend the truth. We must have the courage to do so ourselves and to defend others who refuse to cower before these charlatans and shameless panderers. Part of the truth is that individual acts of bigotry and racial animus will continue, but systemic racism is now the purview of the woke and the misnamed anti-racist. They have surrendered their moral authority as Hannah Arendt's explains by hating others more than they love the truth. We are not just waging a political battle. We are engaged in spiritual warfare. Paraphrasing Solzhenitsyn, Rod Dreyer says, quote, the ordinary man may not be able to overturn the kingdom of lies, but he can at least say he is not going to be its loyal subject. Dreyer also quotes Vlado Palko, a Slavic academic who braved police water cannons to stand with his fellow Catholic protesters at the candle demonstration in Bratislava in 1988 to pray for freedom. He declares, quote, the truth has the power to end every tyranny. William Carney, an ex-slave who escaped to freedom via the Underground Railroad, received the Congressional Medal of Honor for his actions at the Battle of Fort Wagner in 1863. When the color guard was killed, Carney, a member of the Massachusetts 54th Regiment, whose monument was desecrated this summer as well, uh, grabbed Old Glory, and despite being shot five times, he brought the flag back to the Yankee lines, declaring to his fellow soldiers, I only did my duty. The old flag never touched the ground. 
Like him, I will cast my lot with the constitution of liberty, with a regime that has tried to instantiate the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. I will hold up the banner of freedom as long as I am able to my last breath. And when it falls from my hands, I pray there will be either eager hands to catch it and never let it touch the ground. Mm -hmm.